Happiness was what she called it, but I knew that happiness was a word like madness, like sickness, like confusion, like loss, like death, even like beautiful or pure or angelic or God. Happiness was a word that represented some deeper, inexplicable, heavy idea, the kind of idea that goes back and forth between two different worlds. That was Chinelo Okparanta reading to us from her stunning debut novel, Under the Udala Trees. Welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you so much for inviting me. This book has been a long journey for you. It's brought you here to Paris yes. and because it's been translated into French. Um, it's about a young gay woman's coming of age in Nigeria during the Nigerian Civil War. Tell us about where this journey started. What was the inspiration for it? Well, initially, I wanted to write a story about a family, and I wanted to write this story um, to show what journeys the characters in the in the in the family or the you know the family members have gone through. Um, but as I as I wrote the first few drafts of the novel, I realized that the one story that stuck out to me was the story of Ijoma. That was the the important. Um, essentially the heart of the novel and so I followed I followed that character and this is the novel that came about but I'll say that my my mother's story also inspired me because my mother lived during the Nigeria Biafra civil war and she also lost her father during the war. Now while the war rage, um, rages around her Ijeoma has to grapple with the dangers of her emerging sexuality and her love for Amina Mm -hmm. another character in the book. Now, when the relationship is discovered, her mother gives her Bible lessons mm -hmm. as a way to prove to her that her act of love was an abomination. Now, the book suggests that a narrow reading of the Bible um, is partly to blame for Nigeria's treatment of gay communities. Um, can you talk more about that for us? You know, I, um, I grew up a Jehovah's Witness, and so I grew up really studying the Bible. And uh, uh, as a child, I had so many questions about why we interpret the Bible um, and the stories in the Bible the way we do. Um, as an adult, I studied with uh, Marilyn Robinson, a, a Bible scholar, when, when I was at the University of Iowa. And I asked her those same questions. And, and you know, I think it's important, which is something I learned from Marilyn Robinson, um, I think it's important to keep in mind the context of the Bible. So it's not only the interpretations and misinterpretations of, of the Bible, but also that certain laws and certain rules in the Bible um, existed for practical reasons during certain time periods. And, and it's also important to, 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 to see if those rules still apply today and to, to research to see what the practical reasons were um, for, in order to understand why we have those rules in the Bible. You know, uh, it's, it's an interesting thing, the, the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament, even between those two books, laws change, rules change. So why do we no longer change certain rules? And you've discovered um, through your research that in the past, um, some cultures in Nigeria weren't against women um, to women um, marriages. Your mm -hmm. gra grandmother was married um, <laughs> to another woman. Why did homosexuality become a sin? Well, I mean, you know, based on my research, it seems to be that, you know, the Western missionaries brought this idea of homosexuality as a sin. Now, yes, it is true that my uh, grandmother was married to another woman, but, you know, people will argue that point. They'll say, well, it was just an economic alliance. It was um, you know, a system that gave into patriarchy. Um, there were reasons why a woman in Igbo land would marry another woman. It was maybe sometimes to continue the family lineage if that woman was unable to, to have a, a baby. Um, but the bottom line is that there was a system in which that existed, that in which a woman-to-woman -woman marriage was permitted, and traditionally it was not looked um, down upon. Um, and so, you know, when we think about it and we, we say, oh, well, that was different. It's not so much different from marriages in the Western world. Those were also financial alliances. A contract. Exactly. And so if you ask me, well, was there love in between, you know, was there love between those two women? 
you know, maybe, maybe not. You know, was there love between the, the alliances that were made in marriage in the Western world? Maybe, maybe not. But the point is that that system allowed it and it was not a crime and it was not looked down upon at that time. So why should it be now? The end of the book is quite hopeful. Um, but you turn the page and in the author's note, um, it says that in 2014, Nigeria's president, Goodluck Jonathan, signed a bill commonly known as the Jail the Gays Bill, mm -hmm. um, criminalising same-sex relationships. Um, you can go to prison for up to 14 years. Mm -hmm. um, and in the, in the northern states, the punishment is death by stoning. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see LGBTQ rights gaining traction in Nigeria? You know, I think literature is very important in a country like Nigeria. This is a country where, uh, you know, the, the younger generation uh, sees politics as, as a way, or used to see politics as a way of changing the world. But at this point, you know, being in the government seems sort of futile. There's, it's not really making the changes that we'd like to see. And so, um, you know, I noticed that many young people now turn to the arts and I think that's a very smart way to go about it because if you cannot change a system top down, sometimes it is, um, it's a good thing to think about other ways, which is to say you can change a system bottom up. And so by changing the way people think, you know, which is what literature does, it changes your thinking, it helps you, you know, sort of examine what, you know, teachings, principles that you've grown up with and to see if you really believe in it. So, you know, many young people are now um, turning toward literature. And I think literature is very important in the fight with, you know, for, for LGBTQ rights. Um, you know, young people are now opening their minds through books. People write about it. If you, if you, um, you know, look at many of the writers today, there are quite a number of people who um, are on the continent writing about LGBTQ rights. And it's not just writers as well. One of the films that got everyone talking at the Cannes Film Festival this year was the lesbian love story Rafiki from the Kenyan director Wanuri Kayu. The director told me, though, that for her, it was first and foremost a love story. Yes. I really wanted to tell a love story first and foremost. There are not enough love stories coming out of Africa. So it was really important for us to be able to tell a really tender, soft, innocent, kind of naive love story about these girls. And despite all the difficulties they go through in the film, I feel like there's such love and such tenderness between the two main characters. Then that's what we wanted to glorify. That's what we wanted to put forth. That's what we really wanted to celebrate, the idea of young love. Nuri's film was actually banned, though, in Kenya mm. um, for promoting homosexuality. Your book tackles gay rights, being gay in Nigeria, but also war and faith, massive mm. subjects. Mm. I mean, how has it been received by your family, by your community in Nigeria? Um, I have a very loving family, and so, you know, it's, it's, been, a <clears throat> it's been a journey in my family. Um, I've been able to speak with my mother openly about, you know, the subjects about which I write. And uh, I feel that I've seen her, you know, become more and more open minded. But in terms of being in Nigeria, I also feel that, um, you know, I'm seeing a journey with my audience in Nigeria. When I first wrote my um, when I wrote my first book, Happiness Like Water, um, you know, there were many Nigerians who were saying things like, your parents must be disappointed in you, embarrassed in you. What are you doing? This is not um, our culture. You've been, you know, brainwashed by the West. And, um, you know, now, after having written uh, Under the Udala Trees, uh, I get messages from Nigerians saying, thank you so much for writing this story. This is my story and it, it's really wonderful to feel seen, to feel that somebody understands what I'm going through. And so, you know, I, I know that this book is important and that this book is reaching those people that it needs to reach. That being said, the reception has not always been positive because, you know, uh, a few years ago, a couple of years ago, I think I was, I was in Lagos and I was to do a radio interview and uh, the radio host said she can't talk about the novel because if she talked about it, um, she would be fined. And so, you know, there's still a lot of resistance. 
um, and you know people are afraid uh, for their lives in a sense and so um, there's still some work to be done. And it's not just in Africa, it's not just in Nigeria. This week the it's French not. artist Kiddy Smile um, released his debut album which is called One Trick Pony. He's being called an LGBTQ icon here in France. In June he performed at the Elysee Palace wearing a t-shirt that said son of immigrants black and gay. Mm -hmm. um, his new album is a celebration of his identity as a black gay man with lyrics combating racism and homophobia. This isn't just something that's going on in Africa, this is something that's all over Worldwide. the world that we're, we're battling with, isn't it? Yes, definitely. You know, um, there are some, it's interesting how some people can be blind to their own cultures. You know, I live in the US now and uh, some Americans say to me, oh, it's so tragic what's happening in Nigeria. I live in the US, it's tragic what's happening in the US as well in terms of LGBTQ rights and other things. Um, but I think that the novel is also a call for self-reflection, right? So that we don't always say the problem is elsewhere. So that we are um, self-reflective enough to realize that sometimes the problem is in our own home as well. And, and we are uh, one world so that we must work together to, tr uh, to sort of, um, you know, try to make things better for, for all of us. One world. Um, we're going to end the show now with your cultural pick. What have you chosen for us? I have chosen uh, a collaboration between two African women, a Ghanaian and a Nigerian woman, and I think that that is Feminism at Work. Um, it's a, a lovely song by Yemi Alade and Miss V. Chinelle, thank you so much for joining here us here on France 24. Um, your novel, Under the Adala Trees, is out in French now. For more culture news, check out our website. If you're on social media, you can follow us on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. I'll be back next time with my producer, Jennifer Ben-Brahim. See you then.